click. Oh, I should be more center, shouldn't I? Click, click. Live one and welcome to BHT Live here in Chinatown, Vancouver at Maxim's. I should be looking at the camera down right there. Uh, let me know. Uh, I want to just make sure commenting is on so I can see your comments. Let me know if um if the audio is good. I think my AirPods are working. They should be working. And sorry, I didn't announce this. I wasn't planning to, I was planning to go live, but I didn't know exactly when. And I didn't really make much of an announcement, except a little bit of a hint on Instagram. And so, um, yeah, I haven't done a, a live video in probably, I haven't done a proper video in three weeks. I've shot three or four videos already, but I just have to produce them. I'm also busy, uh, just kind of like my last week with the, the like a, Q2 and the Q2 monochrome. So I have these two and I'm kind of doing, I'm kind of A being these two cameras. And as well, I have the uh, GFX 100S and I do have the 817, but unless you set up to be with someone and shooting with someone, it's really, it's a hard lens to, to at least shoot the style that I like to shoot. And so I've been using the 50 F 3.5, which is about like a 40 mil equivalent in full frame. So this has been kind of fun for me, kind of like my street photography camera. So again, I'm here in Chinatown, Vancouver at Maxson's Bakery. I also have the, uh, the Rico GR3 as kind of my EDC camera. How's it going, Skipper? Just having my morning cup of tea. Cheers, buddy, from Japan. Ohio gozaimasu. I hope things are fine in Japan. Yeah, I guess it's around 8. Eight o'clock or nine o'clock in Japan right now. We have daylight savings and regular time. I think we're in. It's funny. I think we are in daylight time, which is regular time, right now here in Vancouver. But we're always fluctuating. So I know Japan is between sixteen and fifteen hours difference. Yes, it's your buddy from the east coast of Canada, but living in Japan. How's it going? And um, yeah, I'm actually, I have a really hokey setup here. I'm using my, let's just see, oh, here we go. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you my setup. I brought a little mini tripod, but it's actually too small. So I actually have my camera, my iPhone, kind of shoved into this Walton Craft Lightning Rider, which is, this bag has been awesome for me. I really, really like this bag as my EDC camera bag. And in here, I've been able to fit the two like Q2s as well as the GFX 100. And if I have the GFX 100 around my neck, I can also fit the 80 F1.7 and then all my other little dock kit like stuff. And so this has been great for me. But here, see, I'm shoving this into the front pocket here, into, into this portion and then into this front pocket. So let me just uh, shove it back in here. And it's being used as like my tripod. And let me just shove that in there and then turn the camera around. And here we go. Now, see, now I messed, I messed with, I messed with perfection. It was in there perfectly. And now the, the horizon is going to bother me if it's not perfectly straight. I think it's, I think it's skewed a bit. I think it's straight. It's level, but it's skewed. There you go. Anyway, so very few people on right now because I know, again, it's an odd time. It's 5 p.m. here on the West Coast. It's 8 p.m. on the East Coast of the United States, so not a horrible time. I think a lot of people are just getting off of work or on the way home from work. You saw my hokey setup here. I should have brought my taller um, Surui monopod with the little mini tripod legs, which is what, is what I used last time I was here at Maxim's. So it, it brings it up about a foot off the table. Because I don't, I don't like the downward, you know, like a lot of people just tilt up the camera and it has this weird, you can see the converging lines. This line is perfectly straight. So I'm looking pretty much directly into the lens of my iPhone. Um, as I was mentioning, I am currently testing the, the Leica Q2. And the way I distinguish the Q2 from the Q2 monochrome is actually just the strap. Both of these are camera film photo Kuda Japanese silk straps. But I put the color for one on the Q2, and also the red dot gives it away. But when it's dark, or if I'm quickly going in and out of my bag, it's just quicker to look at the strap. And then here's another kind of a plain Kuda strap, and this is the monochrome. And today I've been pretty much focused on the GFX because I realize uh, I've been having so much fun with the Leicas 
that uh, I've been kind of ignoring the GFX, but GFX, you know, I've just noticed there's no strap on here because the grip is nice. And even with the GFX 50S, I prefer it in general if I'm in shooting mode to not use a strap. And the grip is so large on this that it, it works out really nice for me out in the streets. And what I did notice is that because the Q2 and the SL and the SL2 doesn't have an articulating screen, um, even this angle is really nice. So if you're, you know, like I'm five foot five and there's sometimes you just want to kind of shoot directly into someone's face, uh, photograph someone and you want it at eye level, um, you know, and I'm five foot five and my friend, you know, say someone like John Lehman is six foot four, six foot three. I have to shoot up like this and having this angle, it allows me to shoot above my head like this and still get a good idea of what I'm shooting. And I know a lot of people do like this other uh, articulation where if you're shooting um, in portrait mode here, and I use it a few times today, and you have a nice sort of a waist level viewfinder, and then using it like most, like a typical way of using articulation, which is like a waist level. And it's kind of appropriate with the GFX because it is a medium format and waist level shooting is typically uh, waist level type shooting. So yeah, Nathan, I try not to shoot them in the face. Yeah, I know like, I, I guess we have to be a little bit careful with how we say things because you know, we use the term to shoot with photography. I know I try to use certain terms like to capture more often now. Uh, I don't completely avoid shoot. I think within, like you're saying, this is a photo shoot. Uh, this is not a photo capture, I guess it technically is, but uh, sometimes the word shoot is appropriate, but it can be taken out of context. And if I'm having a good time, uh, if you noticed in my review of the GFX 100S on Fuji Love, I've been kind of wandering the streets of Strathcona more often. When I first started my photography, I was always out and about. Hey, John Ishii, how's it going? Uh, John, I'm still trying to figure out the custom C dial on mine. Yeah, I don't um, personally. I'm not a I'm not a fan of this PS uh, PSAM dial on the GFX. I would rather it be an ISO dial with the drive dial as a sub dial below it, which is what's on the XT, XT4 and the XT3. I prefer that. And then you have two virtual dials here instead of having an actual, um, either a shutter speed dial or a exposure compensation dial. I see why they did this because then you can reassign it anything you want, but you could sort of do that with the XS10 two unmarked dials and you can sort of customize them to, to, sorry, the two unmarked ones are I think here and here, but you can customize it to a certain degree. And so that's the way I prefer to shoot. But if you are new to Fujifilm um, and you're used to PSAM, so program, shutter speed priority, aperture priority, manual exposure, and you're coming from a DSLR, coming from Nikon or Canon, this makes complete sense to you. But from a Fujifilm shooter's perspective, aperture priority is when you put the shutter speed dial into A and you control the aperture or you put the lens into A mode and then you use the shutter dial up here to being shutter priority mode. If you want full program, you put the lens and the shutter uh, speed dial into A and now you have program. And then if you want full manual, you just fully control both the shutter speed dial and the aperture dial. And so uh, for us Fuji film shooters, that's kind of uh, normal. Um, but uh, for those coming from other systems, this PSAM dial makes way more sense. I saw another comment that the comments are disappearing right after I see it. The 53.5 you got is killer. Yeah, it's nice. I, I like the 40 mil um, equivalent focal length. It's nice. I have my my... Minolta 45 f2 for my SLR Minolta cameras, the the um, MD mount, and I also have the Leica slash Minolta CL CLE 40 millimeter Simicron or f2, um, and I love that lens as well. So this kind of has that similar field of view, except that this is a four by three aspect ratio lens, right? So it's it's uh, the focal length is similar but the field the the aspect ratio of the image is different i end up cropping it at least to three by two in general unless the photo itself works to be i think one photo i just took it ends up kind of working out i'm not sure if you guys can see that but it's really hard to show these kind of photos but a bike rider just happened to be going past this way with a it's too bright i know and then uh, a taxi is going the other way 
like that. And so for this photo, a four by three aspect ratio works out. But other times I just kind of see things either 16 by nine, three by two, or even 21 by nine, which is a, what is that now? The cinematic ratio of 2.35 to one or something like that. So anyways, I saw another question here. I was a wedding shooter for seven years, got strange looks when I said that to people not in the trade about shooting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyways, uh, for those of you, 20 of you that have joined, thank you for joining. I do apologize for not announcing. As, as, as I mentioned earlier, I didn't um, know exactly when I would come on. I knew I hadn't posted a live video or even just a regular video in a while. But as I said, I'm, I'm bouncing four review cameras at once, the Leica SL2, the GFX 100S, in conjunction with the GFX 50S, and then I have the Leica Q2 and the Q2 monochrome. And so those are a lot of cameras that I'm juggling. And yeah, I wish I could have a videographer with me to record me out taking photos. Notice I said taking photos, not shooting. I was out taking photos, capturing and making images. Uh, on the streets of Vancouver, but I um, don't have that ability to have someone with me all the time due to COVID, but as well as just kind of resources and uh, sort of the ecosystem that I have. Most of my friends are photographers, not videographers. And so, um, and I don't want to bug someone who isn't a photographer or isn't a videographer to come and follow me to just to show you guys what I do, but maybe one day when I grow my channel big enough that I can afford to hire a videographer. Typically, I would think, you know, someone who's a, a friend, but is willing to kind of video record uh, as a favor, I think uh, about 120, 100 bucks a day. I say a day, like, you know, two, three hours is probably considered like a, a decent rate for someone who's your friend, right? So if I can get to a point where I can pay someone um, you know, and if I, if I had a contract or like if I want a grant or something, obviously I would pay them more, um, whatever I can afford. But at this point, it's just myself and Camera Girl and whoever else I collaborate with every once in a while. And I, and I do, again, uh, apologize for, um, for the shakiness. It's on, it's on my camera bag, which is an odd thing to use. For those of you that join a little bit later, I shouldn't move this. Maybe Should I move this or shouldn't I move this? I just want to show you how my setup here is. I have uh, my iPhone on a little tiny mini tripod, but it was too low, so the angle was fine. So I ended up shoving the tripod into the pocket of my camera bag, and so that's kind of how I um, set it up. So, uh, Tripathi, too, how's it going? I know who you are. Is that you, Sibadarshi? We, we, will, we will talk. If you, if you work for food, meaning Maxim's food, then we'll, we'll see. We'll see what happens. How's it going? Three videos a week for the next three weeks. Three videos a week for the next three weeks. Yeah, that'd be a lot of video shooting. And you're going to shoot on what? Your Leica SL2 and your 24 to 90. Actually, 2490 is a good lens. 2490 is a good video lens to use. But, uh, well, anyways, Sabardarshi, uh, we shall talk a little bit later. I think I'm, I think we're, we're all kind of due for a second shot. Because Camera Girl was a little bit worried about me being around out and about and not being fully vaccinated uh and so i do kind of prefer being alone at this time i feel a little bit safer with the one shot both my mother-in-law and my mom have their second shot so i'm really happy about that uh my father's got his second shot he's in japan right now and um once i get my second shot i feel a lot better about being out and about and collaborating with various photographers and videographers but I have a lot of little projects on the go. Um, I've reconnected with Leica, so they're going to be setting me a steady stream of, of cameras. But as well as I have a lot of gear, like I have the Woten Craft stuff video. I've already shot my first my unboxing and first look. I just have to create the video, and that's another thing I hate. I shouldn't say hate. One thing I, I currently don't enjoy doing, which is video editing. And I know even a lot of video editors themselves say that, Getting started editing video is not a lot of fun, but once they get into it, then they're, they get that flow going, right? And that's the thing is I already, I, I see the world in stills. I don't see it as a moving picture. 
and to motivate myself to video edit is very difficult. And then once you break that flow, it's, it's that much harder. I'm just seeing more comments. I don't know why the comments come and then they disappear. Um, none. Hide all chat messages. No, I want live chat, top chat, super chat members and super chat messages. All messages are visible. So yeah, there you go. So let's just keep that here. And so now you can all see what is happening. So unless you guys have any questions, um, I thought maybe you guys might have some questions about the Leica Q2 monochrome, which is going back next week. Having a lot of fun with it. Uh, Fuji flash trigger wish question. Why couldn't they add an internal RF flash trigger? I prefer that to having an uh, external trigger on the hot shoe. Yeah, I guess that's true. Um, I mean, I think one of the best ways to trigger another flash is to have another flash built into the camera. I think a lot of these, more of these Fujifilm Pro cameras don't. I mean, I guess they could use the tally light uh, as, a, as, a, as a close kind of a, a trigger. But yeah, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a good question. I think the thing is to build something into a system and then only 10%, because I know a lot of my photographer friends, they don't even really have flashes. They pretty much use available light. And so I understand why a manufacturer wouldn't put in a feature if very few of their uh, customers will even use it. Even using the 2.5 millimeter remote, um, it's not as obscure as it used to be. A lot of people now use it, like people used to use it for time-lapse, but now it's also remote control for um, gimbals. And so more and more manufacturers are putting uh, the 2.5 millimeter remote uh, jack into a lot of their cameras. But there are other things that are removed, a lot of them being like built in. Oh, what's that? You try? Okay, thank you, Michelle. I, I, I keep on being fed, fed things here. I was, I was, they sent me like, some extra danishes. Now, I think it's the Chinese, like a soup? Oh, it's like a ginger, it's like a ginger, sweet ginger soup. Oh yeah, there you go. Big, big pieces of ginger here. So they feed me like I'm a little kid here, which is cool. So I apologize for eating on camera, but this is supposed to be consumed uh, war uh, warm or hot. So let me just take a sip. Ah, yes. I think my mother-in-law even puts little bits of, um, um, she puts in little bits of like a, like a mochi, like a rice ball and puts sugar inside this kind of a ginger soup, but it's good. It's probably healthy for me as well. Let me just check your comments here as well. What food did you get? Milk tea? Uh, Dodo. I, I posted an Instagram stories. Uh, no, no, real. I posted an Instagram reel that showed everything that was on my table. I, I pretty much finished eating first, and then I went to Instagram Live. So it's kind of like two in one. I get to eat, but as well as to create a reel. So three in one. Create reels and stuff for Instagram, and then do a YouTube Live. But now I feel rude to to my mother, uh, my mother-in-law. My wife is going to kill me. She'd be like, Take, stop slurping. And now I'm, I'm talking to 26 people. 26 of my YouTube friends while I while I sip here. I try my best not to sip. I love ginger. And I love sugar. Put it together, you get Chinese ginger sugar soup. Does anyone know what that's called? There is more in here other than ginger. It looks like there's carrots and there's mushrooms and maybe it's not mushrooms, walnuts, almonds, dates. And I'm assuming I'm not supposed to drink, I'm not supposed to eat the stuff in here. I'm supposed to just just sip the soup here. Let me see here, more comments coming in. Let me, too bad I have to touch the screen. Let me see here, Ohio TAC Motors. Oh, TAC Motors, you are a friend of my brother's. You do cool, check out TAC Motors. I think they do the, the either repair Japanese cars or modify Japanese cars or something like that, but how's it going? And Flantia, how's it going? Jay, cheers from North Vancouver. Can you make it here on time? And Frederick, how's it going, Frederick? And John just joined from Perth. I, I, I really am hoping to get to the UK this fall, but I'll, I'll let you know 
what's happening. Slurping in Hong Kong style restaurant is implicitly left. I know, right? Even at ramen shops, my wife knows Japanese. It's it's almost offensive not to slurp your ramen when you eat it, right? And even like the tea ceremony when you drink, you're supposed to to sort of slurp to show that you appreciate it. My wife won't have any of it. She said no. Uh, let me see here. There you go, Nathan. When I was taught how to eat ramen, uh, was taught slurping is polite. Go with that. I know, right? So even when I'm having ramen, my wife's like, this isn't Japan. And then when I'm in Japan and I slurp, she's like, you're not from Japan. Technically, I was born in Japan, so I am from Japan. Um, I thought your wife is also Japanese. A lot of people say that. A lot of people actually, they look at me and they think I'm Chinese. And they look at my wife and think she's Japanese. And she also gets Thai. And I know she looks a little bit kind of exotic or like not like regular Hongkongese, but both her parents are from Hong Kong. So she's, and she looks a little bit like her mom and her dad. I, I could see both in her. So clearly she is a child of two Hong Kongers. And so she is 100%, she wasn't born in Hong Kong. She was born here in Canada, but she is ethnically Hong Kongese, Hong Konger, and I am born in Japan, but she's very Canadian, very Canadianized. So I was in Hong Kong and Shenzhen. Oh, awesome. Would love to, would love to visit the Guangzhou and Shenzhen, but I would obviously go with someone that can kind of take me around. I know there's a train that goes directly in, but being both Japanese, being Canadian, as well as a photographer, I don't know if that will... Um, be such a, I don't know if they'll uh, authorize me to enter or not, or who knows, who knows. I know John Lehman, the time I did a video with him and he was trying to get to North Korea through China and the Chinese government refused to give him a visa just to land in China and then fly to North Korea. So North Korea approved John's visit, but China didn't. And John felt that it could be because he was a photographer and they weren't happy about that because he was kind of a high profile photographer, right? He he worked for the Canadian press. And so I don't know, we'll see if they'll let me into the country or not. But I would love to visit uh, Shenzhen and Guangzhou. That's sort of that tri cities of Hong Kong, you know, like they call it the, the Asia Silicon Valley, I guess. I would love to visit there. And John saying about before COVID, Shenzhen was fine, but now, yeah, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Hey, it's funny. I'm getting a message here from Vichelle. Yeah. But he probably doesn't follow me on YouTube. So anyways, if you guys have any more questions, there's 37 of you guys now. Thank you so much for joining. Um, for those of you who are just, just joined, uh, I'm just here. I was out and about shooting with the GFX 100S with the 50 5 and the like a monochrome with the monochrome strap and the like a did I say M10? Like a Q2 monochrome, and this is the Q2 non-monochrome because of the strap. So that's kind of why I'm I've been delinquent in my YouTube videos because I've been so busy just shooting and not making videos. Because you know, for a lot of YouTubers, that's what they are. They are YouTubers. I'm I don't consider myself a YouTuber. I consider myself a photographer who uses YouTube to sort of showcase, you know, what I do and sort of do my reviews because sometimes it's easier to just create a video than to write an article. And I find that I reach more people via YouTube. But um, anyways, I've been busy taking photos and that's kind of the problem. I don't have a team that I work with that helps me with tests and stuff. I have to kind of do it myself. So uh, here's Vlan, Vlantia, do you shoot much slide film? I haven't shot slide in a very long time, to be honest. What are your general thoughts of slide versus negative? Slide has a very narrow exposure latitude, so you have to make sure that your exposure is pretty spot on. And unlike negative film, remember negative, um, you have to watch out for your shadows. Don't worry so much about your highlights because your highlights on a negative is actually density, right? It's dark. So um, with a Slide is more like digital photography. With slide, you have to watch your highlights. Make sure that you don't blow out your highlights. And that's where third stops began. If you had a camera with third stops, the reason why you had third stops was because you needed, there was, a, there was enough exposure latitude 
I shouldn't say latitude. It was enough of a difference where if you change your exposure by a third of a stop, you could see it on slide. It didn't make much difference on, on, on negative film. You know, you had up to like, in terms of difference, a half, a third of a stop difference is almost no different on a negative. But on a slide, it made a difference. And so, and that's why I was kind of, um, you know, exposure compensation dials that show third stops. I'm not a fan of third stops and exposure comp. I don't mind um, ISO being in third stops, but I don't like exposure conversation being in third stops. If I needed that type of accurate exposure, then I would want my shutter speeds to be in third stops. And to a certain degree, on certain types of lenses, third stop on lenses is nice. But, you know, with Leica cameras, it's full stops on your uh, shutter speed dial and it's half stops on your lenses if you have Leica glass. But on an M7, because it has exposure compensation and auto DX encoding, you can actually get third stops on the Leica M7. So on an M7, you can shoot slide. On an M6, it's trickier because, again, unless you have a Voigtlander lens with third stops, if you have a Leica glass, half stops, and Leica shutter speed in full stops, you can't get third stop exposures unless you're using like like weird ND filters that are in third stops or so. Uh, so uh, anyways, it, it's finicky, but in the end, it's beautiful. I know, uh, like, for instance, someone like Greg Gerard, uh, Greg for a day on Instagram, he shoots a lot of his night photography stuff on slide film. And that's very tricky to shoot that kind of stuff on slide, but it's beautiful. The colors are nice. Um, uh, yeah. you, and a lot of times people would say, like, you know, real photographers will shoot with slide. Um, that's not necessarily true, but you get to control the exposure. With color negative, the printer can decide how your image should look. Or on slide, you decide. You basically, you're baking in uh, into the image what the exposure is. And so if you are very particular, particular about your output of your images, um, I mean, now with Photoshop, you can scan your negatives, you know, by duping it, either using a scanner or, or duping it with another camera. And then in, in Photoshop or Lightroom, you can still fiddle with it. But in the old days, you know, people didn't have access to a color uh, one-hour lab to make all the adjustments. So it was a lot easier for a lot of uh, great photographers to just kind of know the behavior of the film, shoot slide, know exactly if they're shooting the sunset, if they're going to be a third stop under to basically black out all the shadows and just focus on light. Or if they wanted to balance something where you want kind of half shadows and maybe blow out the highlights a little bit, that you can do on slide. With color negative, you couldn't do that. You have to tell the printer how to adjust for that. So that's kind of why a lot of photographers shot slide. And a lot of the slide film had a lot of character, like the original E100, like Kodachrome. Um, they have a certain look to it. And it's baked in, right? So because of that baked in look, it had a very, very specific kind of a quality to it that a lot of photographers like. Let I me mean, just have a little bit more of this ginger, ginger sugar soup here. I feel bad if I don't drink at least half of it. Um, let's see if I've been missing any comments here. Oh, I've, I've missed quite a few here. Let me see here. Uh, come to Greece. I would love to come to Greece. Uh, John Ishii, cool strap. Yeah, go to camera film photo. This is the new, the new Kuda uh, Japanese silk strap. He has three different colors. I like this one here, but I also like this plain one, this plain one that I have on the uh, on the Q2 monochrome. Um, Vlantia, in my understanding, slide color would last longer than negative. Yeah, in terms of stability, if you store color slides, specifically Kodachrome, but of course Kodachrome is gone, it was considered the most stable of all the slide films. A lot of insurance companies, a lot of museums would use Kodachrome as their archival type film to use so that you get as mo the most accurate colors and such, and you would get no color shifting. Color negatives do color shift, but... Um, you know, again, because it's a color negative, when you print, you can just adjust for that, right? Or slide, it is what it is, but it will also shift over time, but it shifted less. So yes, that's another thing. Uh, uh, slide was more stable. Um, uh, Bruno asked me about um, Kodak, any tips with Kodachrome? infrared and aerochrome so i have shot yeah i'm in the generation where i did shoot uh the original uh the ectochrome the infrared the true infrared eir i even have i think one roll 
left, in like inbox, and I've shot a few rolls of it. It's beautiful. It is different than Aerochrome. Aerochrome is not a true, I don't think it's a true infrared, but it kind of mimics that look a little bit. But I have not shot the Aerochrome, so I don't know. I'm actually, in fact, thinking of converting one of my older Fujifilm cameras and converting the sensor into a full spectrum infrared uh, camera. I'm hoping to, anyways. Either I'm going to do the X100F or my X-H1. Let me know what do you guys think, if I should do that or not. Um, you see here, how are you processing the monochrome files? No raw color controls available. No, there is no color sliders, Janelle, good question. There is no color sliders because there is no color information. Each pixel is just basically capturing gradients of light, right? Everything from a black to a white and all the gradients of gray in between. So because of that, um, you don't, there is no color sliders. You need to physically put red filters, yellow filters, green filters, if there's a certain look you want. So um, these uh, lens hood does uh, thread off and there's a 49 mil filter thread. So uh, one of the suggestions I actually had for like, a, and I'm gonna mention this in my video with you is that having rotating color filters inside the lens, cause this is a leaf shutter camera anyway. So they could put a rotating, like a sort of a wheel with color filters. And I would recommend red, yellow, they can put in three, red, yellow, and green. And actually a fourth one, a neutral density filter. I think that would be great if they have it built into the Leica Q3. Uh, but if not, then yeah, you would need to be very aware of, of how to, um, how, like what, what you're trying to get out of black and white and then use the proper filter to make sure that you're gonna get the right colors. So, but a good question there. Hello, how's it going, Gordon? I'm just doing a live, live, live video. This is Chef Gordon. If you guys have seen him appear in, where have I posted him? I think I posted him on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, how are you? Oh, there you go. So, have you ever used 90 minimum lens for street photography? I have used 90. I do have the the. Uh, Minolta M Rorcore 90mm f4, and I have world Leica's 90mm uh, Summicron. If you go back to older uh, Leica SL, the original SL review, I actually do have. In if you go to my blog and just type in uh, Leica SL, you'll see that I have um, uh, pictures with the 90 f2 for street. It is more difficult though, for sure. It's not easy, and shooting on a M body, you have an F2, you're not gonna hit focus very easily. So, you know, you would stop down to like, that's why I don't mind the Minolta and Rooker F4. I think F4 at 90 on a rangefinder, there's enough leeway there so that I can get an image in, in sharp focus. Uh, that's why something like an SL with focus peaking, although focus peaking on the SL and the SL2 was never that great. So um, you can do it. Someone, a photography, if you look them up, Saul Leiter, Saul Leader. Um, I think it's actually pronounced Leiter, but most people say Saul Leader. He is um, well known for compressed street photography. And so if you look at Saul Leiter's work, you'll see him often shooting with a 90 or 135 in his photographer. Highly compressed, so it's kind of artsy where he isolates things. A really good photography. Not easy to do street with a 90, but you can definitely pull it off, right? Make it into your own style. And Nathan saying that the X100 with the ND built in ND, yeah, and same with the 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 uh, Ricoh GR also has a built in ND filter. So I, that's why I think that the the Leica Q2 can also have a built in ND filter. But if it had a color filter wheel for the M monochrome, I think that would be even cooler. Another sip of my ginger sugar soup, which is not cold, but because it's ginger and sugar, it still tastes good. And let me just check here. Have you used any of the Sigma Foveon cameras? I would love to, but I have not. With the stacked filters, right, that are the sensor where each color, each layer is one color. I like the technology. I think it's really cool. Great black and white and has great color. Yeah, I hope they continue that sort of sort of off the mainstream, just like how Fujifilm uses their own color filter array other than the Bayer, but the X-Trans, it's a little bit different, right? Um, where Sigma is using stacked filter, uh, sorry, stacked sensor, which each layer is a different color. So you need a lot of light. So I think it didn't have great high ISO performance, but they were saying that their, 
whatever it was at the time, 16 or 20 megapixel sensor was actually more like a 50 or 60 or something like that, right? And I know that DP Review did a, a really good, maybe at the time there was a camera store, uh, did a review of the Sigma Foveon censored uh, camera. And they said, yeah, it's true. The really great images coming out of that. And saying they make great point and shoots with leaf shutters. Yeah, I love cameras with leaf shutters. Uh, you know, they're quiet. And also you get really high flash sync speed. Uh, the Leica Q2 maximum shutter speed is only one two thousandth of a second. That's why I'm saying a built-in ND filter would be nice in a camera like this. And also flash sync right up to one two thousandth of a second, right? Even though the literature says one five hundredth of a second, it's not true. I, even the original Q, I think, if you look up the Q and it says flash sync up to one five hundredth, I tested it right up to one two thousandth. It's fine up to one two thousandth. No weird um, shutter syncing issues uh, with the Q and the Q2 at maximum shutter speed. So, um, you know, one 2000 flash shutter sync where you know, something like a GFX uh, flash sync is, I think, one one twenty fifth of a second. In APS-C, it's about one two fiftieth of a second. Um, so, yeah, you get high flash sync, which means you don't need a really powerful flash. I use this um, Fujifilm uh, EF-X20 flash unit. I like it because it has immediate manual flash control on any camera other than Fujifilm, right? From 164th to one to one power here. And you just got to work out the um, the guide number power on this, which is 20 meters or like close to 60 feet. And this, you know, basically the center pin is what triggers it. So if your camera doesn't match, um, it still works in non-TTL mode. On Fujifilm cameras, this is a TTL flash. One negative about this is it uses AAA batteries, which I'm not a fan of. And also it has a type of on-off where you, it's, a, it's a long press on. So sometimes you can't tell if it's on or not. You have to kind of put your ear to it, turn it on, and hear it kind of booting up. You can hear the capacitors being loaded up. So that's the one negative. But the thing is it's so tiny here. And with the leaf shutter, one two thousandth of a second, I'm shooting outdoor daylight at a quarter power or half power. And it really exposes your subject really well. And so you need something tiny like this where if you have a non-leaf shutter, regular flash, you're stuck at one two fiftieth of a second unless you have a specialized flash. But if not, you're stuck at one two fiftieth, which means typically you stop down to let's say f5.6 or f8, which means you need to overpower uh, the sun to be able to still light your subject. So it's a little bit trickier. You get more flexibility with a leaf shutter with daylight fill flash. And so that's another reason why I really like um, leaf shutter cameras. And so X100 flash sync with ND for low depth of field daylight uh, lit portrait is great. Yeah, that's the kind of stuff you would do, right? And Vlantia is saying, heard about Nikon. Yeah, I saw that Nikon retro style APS-C camera. It looks, it looks like a Fujifilm camera, but hey, Fujifilm cameras look like Leica's or even like that 70s, 80s era all-in-one kind of range finder point and shoot like the um, Canonettes and the Hymatics. Um, so everyone kind of copies everyone, right? So uh, yeah, power to them. I hope Nikon doesn't go out of business, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, 40 minutes, I'm gonna stop it now, guys, because um, Maxim is closing in 15 minutes, but as well, I'm using up data, and data costs me money, so uh, this show maybe cost me 15 bucks, but it's worth it to keep you guys happy. So thank you so much for watching, everyone. Don't forget to like the video once I close it and it goes onto my regular um, YouTube video thing. Uh, don't forget to subscribe, tell your friends, and happy shooting. Click, click.